Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what, he have, what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before them, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hid their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers. Though he has done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life. And the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great 
and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counsel among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears 
to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gathered. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Are those who heard me what I said to them, they know what I said. 
When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. If I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not hand him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves, and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium, and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own? Or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, My kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you 
as the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, in order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge, soaked in a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. 
He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted him. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths, along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, we just heard a very emotional account of the Passion from St. John. It's one of the most beautiful accounts of the Passion, I think, because of all the little details that are in it. The detail about the charcoal fire is very interesting, and it's put in there for a very specific purpose, because it's not just any fire that Peter warms himself by. It's a charcoal fire, because later on in the Gospel of John, when Jesus is out having breakfast, by a fire and Peter and his disciples see him, it's specifically a charcoal fire. It gives Peter that opportunity to redeem or to experience that redemption of Jesus Christ, because after all, he did deny him. And right there in front of the charcoal fire, where Peter denies him, is where Jesus asks Peter, do you love me three times? There's also the detail of the blood and water flowing from the side of Jesus as he's pierced. And that is if you have especially devotion to the divine mercy from Saint um, Faustina, a Polish nun in the early, uh, in our recent times. She wrote about the divine mercy of Jesus and that image that she uses that has that caption, Jesus, I trust in thee, has red and white streams or rays coming out of Christ's heart. This is, uh, and um, Faustina drew this to, um, to show the streams or the rays of blood and water that flow from the heart of Christ is the source of the church. The two primordial sacraments, baptism and Holy Eucharist, the blood and the water represent these. Today, we celebrate the death of Christ. It seems a little weird saying that, but we do celebrate the death of Jesus Christ. And although we're not celebrating All Souls Day, that's in another month, we might as well be celebrating All Souls Day today as well, because it was for you and me and our loved ones that Jesus Christ submitted to the cross 2,000 years ago. Obviously, things are very weird right now for everyone because we're not able to be um, with each other. But yet, we know, Father John and myself and Deacon Dale and Wayne, we all know that we're going to see most of you again. Why? Because we've seen glimpses of you when you've driven through to receive the palms on Palm Sunday. We've heard glimpses of you calling the office or maybe emailing us with something. And we know that this virus will not kill most people. So by the grace of God, we're going to see you again. Yet it feels like in a way when we celebrate services here and liturgies here that in a sense, everyone is gone. 
I don't want to sound too morbid, but in a sense, everyone has died. It's like we're in a ghost town. I would like to suggest that our Christian hope, the way that we as Christians and Catholics see death, is like this, what I just described. That, you know, when we say goodbye to someone who has died, we have that utmost confidence that they're not gone for good, that we will see them again, and we'll see glimpses of them, not in the same way that we're used to. We'll see glimpses of them driving by. We'll see glimpses of them in the beauty of nature, glimpses of them in the humor that we hear that reminds us of them. But we don't quite experience them in the same way that we did when they were alive. It's the same now. We know that we're here with each other, that you're here watching us and here with us spiritually, but physically it's very different. But I have that hope and, I mean, certainty that I'm going to see you again. That's the hope and the certainty that you and I are called to have in death. Because of Christ Jesus dying on the cross, and submitting to death, you and I are able to inherit the gift of eternal life. This is a great joy and a great mystery, but we too often gloss over the whole death part, the Good Friday part, in order so that we can rush right forward into the resurrection where all the nice Easter bunnies are and the colorful flowers and everything else. Why not just rush through Lent, go right to the good stuff, huh? It's all part of it. We pass through death in order to inherit eternal life because of God's only Son who died on a cross for you and for me so that we might share this eternal life with him. Let us pray for Holy Church. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard and unite her throughout the whole world, <coughs> and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Por el Papa, oremos también por nuestro Santo Padre, el Papa Francisco, para que Dios nuestro Señor, que lo escogió para el orden de los obispos, lo conserve a salvo y sin daño para bien de su Santa Iglesia, a fin de que pueda gobernar al pueblo santo de Dios. Dios Todopoderoso y Eterno, cuya sabiduría gobierna el universo, atiende favorablemente vuestras súplicas y protege con amor al, al Papa que nos diste, para que el pueblo cristiano, que tú mismo pastore, pastoreas, progrese bajo su cuidado en la firmeza de la fe. Por Jesucristo, nuestro Señor. Amén. Let's pray for all orders and decrees of the faithful. Let's pray also for our Bishop Gregory, for all bishops, priests and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. 
Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed. Hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Por los catecúmenos, oremos también por los catecúmenos, para que Dios nuestro Señor abra los oídos de sus corazones y les manifieste su misericordia, y para que, mediante el bautismo, se les perdonen todos sus pecados y queden incorporados a Cristo, Señor nuestro. Dios Todopoderoso y Eterno, que sin cesar con seres nuevos hijos a, a tu iglesia, acrecienta la fe y el conocimiento de los caricúminos, para que, renacidos en la fuente del bautismal, los cuentes entre tus hijos de adopción. Por Jesucristo, nuestro Señor. Amén. For the unity of Christians, let us also pray for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gathered what is scattered, and keep together what you have gathered. Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those who one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by the integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Por, los, por los judíos, Oremos también por los judíos, para que a quienes Dios nuestro Señor habló primero, les conceda progresar continuamente en el amor de su nombre y en la fidelidad a su alianza. Dios Todopoderoso y Eterno, que confiaste tus promesas a Abraham, y a su descendencia, oye compasivo los bregos de tu iglesia, para que el pueblo que adquiriste primero como tuyo merezca llegar a la plenitud de la redención. Por Jesucristo, nuestro Señor. Amén. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty and ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ, that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witness to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Por los que no creen en Dios, oremos también por los que no conocen a Dios, para que buscando con sinceridad lo que es recto, merezcan llegar hasta él. Dios Todopoderoso y Eterno, que creaste a todos los hombres para que, deseándote, te busquen y en, encontrándote, descansen en ti, concédenos que, en medio de las dificultades, de este mundo, 
al ver los signos de tu amor y el testimonio de las buenas obras de los creyentes. Todos los hombres se alegren al confesarte como único Dios verdadero y Padre de todos. Por Jesucristo nuestro Señor. Amén. For those in public office, let us pray for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct our minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace, peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favour we pray on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Por los que se encuentran en alguna tribulación, oremos hermanos muy queridos a Dios Padre Todopoderoso para que libre al mundo de todos sus error, errores, al, aleje las enfermedades, alimente a los que tienen hambre, libere a los encarcelados y haga justicia a los oprimidos, conceda seguridad a los que viajen, un bueno retorno a los que se hallan lejos de hogar, la salud a los enfermos y la salvación a los moribundos. Dios Todopoderoso y Eterno, consuelo de los afligidos y fortaleza de los que sufren, escucha a los que te invocan en su tribulación para que todos experimenten en sus necesidades la alegría de tu misericordia. Por Jesucristo, nuestro Señor. Amén. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us Just hold it.
Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my voice in supplication. If you, O Lord, mark iniquities, Lord, who can stand? But with you is forgiveness that you may be revered. At the Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord, Lord I am Lord, not worthy to be seen in one of my room, room but only say the word, and my soul shall be.
Preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people, who have honored the death of your Son, in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.